Welcome, Venerable Yenton. Hi, folks. Nice to see you. We'll go ahead and start, and we'll start as usual with Refuge in Bodhicitta. So if you want to just take a minute, we'll set our motivation. Sangge chudon so ki chunam pai jancho padu dani capsuchi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki gola penje sangge jupa show sangge chudon so ki chunam la jancho padu dani capsuchi Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Drona penche sangge drupa show Sangge churon so ki chunam la Janchu padu dane capsu chi Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Drona penche sangge drupa show and just connecting with that motivation. Okay. So uh, welcome to Exploring Buddhism. And uh, the topic we're looking at is common prayers and practices. And um, I'm just uh, kind of sussing out um, are you guys puja people? <laughs> what do pujas a lot? Or are you kind of like tiptoeing into it? Or um, totally um, ritual stuff is weird and far out and this is hopefully your chance to see if it's fun or not. Um, you know, do you, has everyone here, I guess, done a medicine Buddha puja? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, so maybe a couple haven't, but most people have. Okay, all right. So when we're doing pujas and practices, uh, you will have noticed that they're very rarely explained, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, there's good commentaries, there's all sorts of stuff you can find online, but then you wonder, is it a valid source? Is it something reliable? And, uh, you know, it's easy to generate doubt. And then some things kind of happen during rituals that uh, the older students seem to just magically know what they're doing. And you just kind of look at them and go, okay, there's a lot of smells and bells. And somehow people magically know how to start chanting here and to be quiet there. And it feels a little bit, um, can be a little bit distancing or off-putting to kind of be with people that have been practicing a long time together and not know if you're kind of okay to be there or not, or, you know, if you're being an imposter or an interloper. Um, so it can be a bit awkward if you kind of don't know the basics. Um, even if you've been Buddhist for years and years, sometimes pujas are kind of the alien component. And some days you're game and some days you're not, I'm guessing, right? So you've been Buddhist many years, but sometimes there's something about pujas where you're like, nice to see people, <laughs> nice to visualize, but uh, you know, some of the other bits are a little bit obscure. Um, I think today we're, we're gonna focus in mainly on Medicine Buddha Puja um, and Medicine Buddha. And the seven limb prayer in particular, because the seven limb prayer is something that comes up in almost every single prayer practice puja. So um, each of these Exploring Buddhism sessions on exploring common prayers and practices will talk about something kind of universal that you see all over the place. And then we'll zoom in on a particular deity's practice as well. And then actually just do that practice together and see what questions come up when it's fresh. So, um, so today we're doing Medicine Buddha Puja in the next session, and hopefully it will spark your memory of other times you've done it and questions that you've had. Or if you've never done it before, you can kind of have a moment of going, okay, I really connect with some of those prayers and some of them just do not resonate at all. Please explain. So, um, so you all have a copy of the text and we're meeting again tomorrow as well. So you'll have time to kind of let it sit and brew. So there are a number of reasons why we do pujas and practices together in a group. There's some really basic community building reasons. You know, when you're all together, you build relationships. 
common sense, right? Basic, basic psychology. But there's also a power in doing group practice, which is a little bit more ephemeral, a little bit harder to pin down, a little bit more esoteric, but is listed in a number of sutras and tantras that the merit created is more. And I think that part of us already feels that if you've done a group meditation practice or a puja together in a moment where you felt kind of grounded and connected, even if you didn't know everything that was going on. Sometimes it's easier to focus in a group or sometimes it's easier to kind of get into the flow or into the connection with the deity with a group, particularly if a Lama is present or particularly if it's a group of people you feel comfortable with. But do you know what I mean, where there's a quality that's a little bit different in the doing it together? Yeah, there might also be extra distractions just because of human dynamics and all sorts of movement and things. But if you're in the right headspace for it, group practice has significantly more power than practice alone. And particularly for beginners, it can be such a useful thing. So um, it's just something to explore a little bit. And then of course we have these pandemic situations where we're alone together. <laughs> And then what does that do, this alone together? But I'm guessing that because all of you are sort of Buddhist or Buddhist adjacent, you probably will have read articles that they've done over time about pockets of the world where there's been concentrated meditation practice and the crime level going down. Everybody individually in their homes doing prayers for peace of whatever denomination, whatever tradition, in a concentrated way, crime rates go down, hospitals have fewer accidents, things generally are better in those pockets where people have done concentrated practice together at the same time, even if they were in different parts of the town. So, um, so those articles always really inspire me. I'm sure you guys have heard different articles of that type and different sort of um, experiments of that type, but it kind of can reinforce your conviction that it's worthwhile to do practice and it's even more worthwhile to do practice at the same time as other people. We help each other. Um, sometimes I think about, you know, parallel things like if you're trying to do some sort of annoying work like taxes or um, some sort of busy work from your workplace that you're not really excited about and you go do it in a cafe with lots of people, maybe lots of distractions, but somehow it's easier to focus. Or maybe you go to a library and it's quiet, but there's lots of people there. You could be quiet at your house by yourself, but somehow doing it in the library, you have a little bit more momentum. So sometimes we have experiences like this that can help us understand that power of group practice. Um, so in pretty much every single prayer and practice in Tibetan Buddhism, you're gonna find some classic prayers. You're gonna find refuge in bodhicitta, you're gonna find the four immeasurable thoughts, and you're gonna find the seven limb prayer, and then et cetera. <laughs> Right? But those three common ones are going to keep coming up again and again and again. And refuge in bodhicitta, I think, is quite obvious and straightforward why we would do that. But just, you know, rather than hear me blah, blah about it, why do we start with refuge in bodhicitta in pretty much every prayer, practice, teaching, etc.? Why launch things that way? Just an educated guess. It puts your mind in that motivational space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, other reasons you might start with refuge and bodhicitta? What does it prevent? What does it support? I think we know, but it's helpful to articulate it. Yeah, Diane? It, it sets um, our intention uh, more strongly, more directly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Before you said the refuge in bodhicitta prayer, you had refuge and you were attempting bodhicitta, right? It's not like it's something you're conjuring up fresh out of nowhere, but it's a little bit like when you're surfing the internet and you've been on one web page for a long time and it kind of starts getting a bit glitchy and you need to hit refresh 
and it starts going smoothly again. It's a little bit like that for us where we need to bring these ideas to the forefront of our mind, to where our mind is today, now in this moment, and kind of give them life back, vitality back, so that our engagement is a lot more genuine and heartfelt and not just kind of like checking boxes or um, it goes without saying. So much of Buddhism relies on the basic premise that depth is built through repetition. Depth is built through repetition. And you're repeating things that you already agree with, that you already have connection with, but you repeat them in order to deepen your engagement and your integration of them. So what do you think doing refuge in bodhicitta might prevent, I guess? What might it kind of uh, help you avoid? Something that might be a bit not helpful in engaging in practice or engaging in class. It helps me to uh, block out the distractions and it helps me to focus. It's like a, a gate or a door. The world is out there and my, my dharma, my spiritual life is in here. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, it certainly helps you focus. And, I, you know, the distractions that you talk about, they could be of so many types, but sometimes when we do our practice, we can do it in a way that it feels like a chore that we should do in order to be a good person. But if you check in with refuge in bodhicitta in a heartfelt way, that helps prevent that. Yeah, you really think the reason I'm doing this is to cultivate my mind for the benefit of all sentient beings. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm not doing it because this is what good people do. You're not doing it for kind of superficial reasons that can make it into a chore or into a performance, you know? And you're trying to do these practices in a way that they're always separated from the eight worldly concerns. So like that, yeah, Skylar, go ahead. For me, I'm finding that it's also uh, preventing me from taking refuge in other things like TV or other people's advice. And so it's, it's a way to just remind me like, where is my true north, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. So, you know, refuge in bodhicitta all day, every day, we could just be doing it continuously throughout the day and it would be a good day's work. Um, but if we wanna launch ourselves in a class, if we wanna launch ourselves in a practice, it just gets us in the right headspace right off the bat. So you're feeling internally connected to your refuge, your inner refuge, your outer refuge. You're feeling supported by that. And then you're feeling motivated to do your practice on behalf of all sentient beings, which of course includes yourself, but is not only yourself. So it becomes more than you, more than today, more than a performance, more than a chore, kind of separates yourselves from all of these kind of miscellaneous reasons that can creep into our practice, but only if you connect with it, you know? And, so there's benefit in doing the same form of the refuge and bodhicitta prayer every time, but there's also benefit in sometimes doing different versions to kind of break it up and make sure that it's fresh and clear and vibrant in your mind. So it's really about what works for you in terms of making it alive once again, each day, each time. So you'll do refuge and bodhicitta, and then you're probably going to do the four immeasurable thoughts that's going to come along in almost all practices in uh, sadhana prayer manuals in puja group practices. The four immeasurable thoughts, you know, are something that are shared in both the Pali tradition and the Sanskrit tradition. And they can be talked of in terms of absorptions or meditative concentrations, but they could also be spoken of in terms of just core values. So we got our classics, right? We have love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And it kind of is taking our launch sequence of bodhicitta and then becoming a little bit more specific about what it is we're gonna engage with in order to reinforce and develop our bodhicitta. How are we gonna think? How are we gonna be? How are we gonna live in this world if bodhicitta is our motivation? So, when you're looking at the four immeasurable thoughts, this is always an opportunity to 
do some Tonglen practice if you want. Um, pretty much any time you see the Four Immeasurable Thoughts prayer, you could decide to pause there and do some Tonglen, do some giving and taking meditation. And you could either do it sequentially, line by line, or you could do it at the end of the whole passage. But basically you're thinking, love, may all sentient beings have happiness, rides on the outbreath. Compassion, may all sentient beings be free from suffering, rides on the in-breath. And love and compassion are alternating in and out on the breath and imbued with and informed by joy and equanimity. And if you want to layer in the visualization of black smoke and golden light and destroying the self-cherishing thought and giving all your happiness and roots of virtue to all sentient beings, layer as much elaboration as feels engaging, but not overwhelming. And that's the way we want to approach all practice is the simple form is not wrong, right? The simple form could just be, may all sentient beings have happiness, may all sentient beings be free of suffering. Just simple, gentle, simple. And then start tying that onto the breath when it's familiar enough. And then start adding the visualization when it's familiar enough. And then engage deeper and deeper, more layers with it, but what you're wanting to do is hit that flow state where your mind is concentrated and clear, but hasn't gotten tight or tense. So if you're trying to weave in every commentary and every elaboration that you've ever heard the first time, you will blow a fuse, <laughs> you know, and it will be too much too soon. It could be that the first time you do this, you just say the words of the prayer and think, those are great, right? And moving on, right? You don't have to overthink it the first time. This, you know, but once it gets familiar, there can be an edge of you that starts being a tiniest bit bored. And it's a little embarrassing to admit, and maybe you don't even want to admit that there's part of you that might get bored with repetition, but the boredom can actually be an invitation to layer in more elaboration. Yeah, so there's, it means there's space enough to add the next layer. Does it make sense? So as an example, um, I'll just show you the Medicine Buddha Sadhana. We're not doing it yet, but just um, kind of looking how it goes. So the Medicine Buddha Sadhana or practice manual starts with a visualization. And you would have the, you know, your visualization, you build it up. And if you prefer, you can always um, just kind of look at the picture and stabilize that appearance using just the picture. But the main thing is you think the Guru Buddha is here. And the, the Guru Buddha is in this form today, right now for this session. And whether it's a general idea of blue or it's all sorts of detail, the most important thing is to think they are here. So don't worry too much if your visualization isn't clear. Just think the Guru Buddha is here. And then refuge in Bodhicitta, a very standard form you're used to seeing three times. And then the four immeasurable thoughts, which can be said one time, one line at a time, pausing after each line, doing Tonglen, or said all together, doing Tonglen at the end, all sorts of different ways. But if this isn't the emphasis of your practice today, you can just say it and think it and then move on. And then often in tantric practices, you're gonna get what's called cultivating special bodhicitta. And it will say something like quickly, very quickly. So you've got regular bodhicitta and then you've got special bodhicitta. Um, if you were to just guess what makes special bodhicitta, no guesses. Is that kind of like the, the inner bodhicitta? Well, certainly that's an aspect. Um, I guess it becomes a difference between sutra practice and tantra practice. Yeah. So sutra practice, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Tantra practice, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings quickly. Yeah. So the, the big difference in tantra is speed. 
and the speed is not because of you wanting to, I don't know, win the race or something. The speed is because sentient beings are suffering now in desperate situations and our ability to help is very limited at our stage right now. You know, we can, all we have to do is, you know, read the news and things happening in Ukraine and think, how can I help? How can I help? And you think, okay, maybe I can make a little donation to Doctors Without Borders. Maybe I can write my politicians about policy. Maybe I can do prayers for peace, but our effect is somewhat limited. And we're all feeling a little bit powerless about this situation right now. And it gives us so much sadness and grief. If we were a Buddha, we would know exactly what the Ukrainian people have the karma to receive in terms of conditions to benefit. And we would know exactly what the various world leaders had openings to hear. And we would know exactly and precisely what could be done. Right now, we're just guessing and hoping and trying our best to not make things worse, seeing if we can benefit in some small way but there's a sadness that is not being a Buddha yet. Yeah, a Buddha is not sad when they see this suffering because they have the big picture that all sentient beings have Buddha nature and will be free of their suffering. And then they have the immediate insight to know today, here's what is possible. So the quickly, quickly special bodhicitta is this sense of in order to be of greatest benefit to sentient beings, I must become a Buddha. And it's not enough to just have this as a faraway pipe dream of wouldn't it be lovely when? It's that right now beings could benefit from my enlightenment. Right now they could, but I'm not enlightened yet. So they're not getting that benefit yet. Yeah. And you know the underlying premise being that we all have different degrees of karmic connections with sentient beings. And so our degree of benefit is going to be unique. And there are people and beings that we can benefit in a direct way once we're enlightened that other Buddhas don't have the same karmic connection with. And so they can't benefit them as much as quickly. All Buddhas are equal. All Buddhas have the same qualities, but sentient beings and their relationships are very unique and varied. So we ourselves need to become enlightened for those beings that we have strong karmic connection with. Yeah, so it's quickly, very quickly, but not with any anxiety, not with any panic, not with any pressure, not with any of our like weird socialization we came into the Dharma with, okay? It's not with any kind of tightness. The urgency is about the joy of aspiring to something so beautiful. You know, like think of when you're excited about a holiday with your family, you know, if you like your family, you know, <laughs> thinking about that holiday and all the beautiful things you'll see, beautiful things you'll eat, beautiful music you'll hear, architecture, art, whatever things that you love, the things that you'll connect with together as a family, all of that looking forward to energy really helps you plan in a happy way. Yeah. And we want to take that kind of idea of planning in a happy way for our enlightenment, not in a way of I'm so bad, I should force myself into this perfection because I'm so bad, like don't get weird. You know, it should be a joyful path. And it's not like we aren't of benefit now we are. It's just we could be of more benefit if we perfected our minds. Yeah, so so make sure you're kind of like, hearing the urgency from a way that lifts you and gives some like air and momentum and joy, not in a way that makes you feel panicky or anxious or somehow is oppressive, yeah. And then you'll get the seven limb prayer. So you get refuge bodhicitta then the seven limb prayer. And in the medicine Buddha practice, the seven limb prayer goes, I prostrate to guru medicine Buddha. Each and every offering, including those actually performed and those mentally transformed, I present to you. I confess all non-virtuous actions accumulated since beginningless time. I rejoice in the virtues of both ordinary and noble beings. As our guide, I request you, O Buddha, to please abide well and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. 
All virtues, both my own and those of others, I dedicate to the ripening of the two bodhicittas and the attainment of Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. So that's a quite common form of the seven limb prayer. Um, the name of the Buddha that you're prostrating to will be in accordance with it, whatever practice you're doing. And here's one of the points where if you're in a big group, you can be slightly bewildered because you think those are a lot of concepts very quickly and we're just saying them and then going on. And part of you is like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> right? I'm prostrating, I'm confessing, I'm offering, I'm rejoicing. And you're just kind of like in a flap to think, how can I possibly marry my mind up with those concepts so quickly? And is there some benefit in saying it so quickly? And what is the deal with group practices going so quickly? And the background assumption is, is that you've done some thought and some practice with these at your own speed at your own pace in your house alone and have a relationship with these concepts already. And so of course, it's gonna be a little bit bewildering the first time, especially the speed that we go at in group practices. And you'll notice later today, the Medicine Buddha Puja does the seven limb prayer like seven or eight times very quickly within one puja. And what you're wanting to do here is really zero in on the pith essence that you've understood about the seven limbs, just touching base, touching base, touching base. And your ability to go deeply with these quickly is just familiarity. And if you're doing this by yourself, you're not doing this in a group, what you do is just pick one to drill down and really connect with and do the rest in an abbreviated way. And then the next time you do the practice, drill down on a different one and do the rest in an abbreviated way. And this approach when you're doing your own practice is a really highly recommended approach by many teachers, many lamas. If you're doing a practice again and again, day after day, is rather than give yourself the pressure and the intensity of doing the most elaborate form every single time that you do it, because what'll happen is you'll get overwhelmed and paralyzed and won't do it at all. Instead, you say, I'm just gonna do it gently. I'm just gonna read through it. And at one point, I'm gonna really pause and give it my full attention. So I'm gonna do the whole thing every time, but I'm gonna zero in on a different component each time, or maybe the same component for many weeks or many months before I move on to another section to zero in on. Does it make sense? Like you're kind of spotlighting different sections of the exact same text. And when you kind of spotlight it in this way, your more pithy questions come up that you can then ask teachers later. Like every time I meditate on prostration, I have these issues arise. Or every time I meditate on offerings, these questions arise. And it's hard to even know what your questions are unless you've given it some space and some deep thought on your own. If you are in the position of leading the practice, which some of you might be leading practices at your own centers eventually, or you're just leading yourself by yourself at home, is during a puja to pick one section to give a little bit more time to, and then move on at a normal pace through the rest. So you'll see how I'll do this in the Medicine Buddha Puja after the break. But you know, at one point we'll stop and really be with one, the next round another, the next round another. So you're just kind of like going through it, but the repetition, I guess, is what's really building that nurturing environment for practice. So right now I'm gonna go through the seven limbs and please do um, ask questions if they come up. So what are the seven limbs? Um, the seven limb prayer is one of the six preparatory practices to be done prior to any meditation practice. It became part of the Lam Rim tradition as taught by Lama Atisha, who received it from Lama Sirlingpa. So this is quite a few centuries old. Of course, these things were indicated by the Buddha and taught by the Buddha, but they got organized at a certain point by people like Lama Atisha. 
So you got your classic six preparatory practices that you do before you meditate. And the first one is just the classic clean the place and set up representations of the enlightened body, speech and mind, or think that they're there. Yeah. And then two is obtaining offerings honestly and arranging them beautifully. So even if it's just one beautiful flower from your garden or some nice fruit that you bought earlier, you're just placing something lovely on the altar. And then adopting the seven featured position of Barachana, taking refuge, developing bodhicitta, four immeasurables, etc. So basically you're sitting and motivating. And once you've sat and motivated, you do number four, which is invoking the merit field which in this case, we were looking at the Medicine Buddha Sadhana, and it was just the visualization of Medicine Buddha on his own at first. Then number five is where the seven limb prayer actually comes in, as well as the mandala offering, and then making requests for blessings. So these six preparatory practices, a lot of them are not meditation, right? You don't even get to meditation kind of strictly speaking until after these, but you're doing practices that are getting yourself into the correct atmosphere for deep practice. So things like cleaning the space, they don't have to be like a deep spring clean. It could just be a quick dust or a quick sweep or making your bed or you know something very basic, but it does help you get into the right headspace. Offerings are not something that you do to placate the Buddhas. Offerings are something you do to create the cause for resources in the future, to help you overcome attachment, et cetera, et cetera. Sitting in the seven featured position of Virachana may not be possible for all of us. This is the full lotus position with the legs all the way up and perfectly straight back. So if you can't sit that way, don't worry about it. Whatever's gonna have the best chance of a straight back, that's the posture we want. Set your motivation, think that the Buddhas are here, and then we do the seven limbs. So the seven limbs are prostration, offering, confession, rejoicing, request to stay, request to teach, and dedication. So when we were looking at it in the prayer, this is the same prayer we were looking at before, some of the limbs are very easy to isolate and some of them are woven together in one sentence. So prostration is obvious. I prostrate to Guru Medicine Buddha. And then each and every offering, including those actually performed and those mentally transformed I present to you, that's the offering verse. And that one is very straightforward because you just do what it says. So the offerings that are actually here on the altar and those that I multiply in my mind, those I present to you, Guru Medicine Buddha, or whoever you're practicing. Then we get into the trickier ones, right? So I confess all non-virtuous actions accumulated since beginningless time in one second, what? That seems nuts. And I rejoice in the virtues of both ordinary and noble beings. What? Okay, so here's where it gets tricky in terms of speed. So how do you confess all negative actions from beginningless time if the chanting leader is just saying, I confess all negative actions from beginningless time, I rejoice in the virtues of ordinary beings and arias, and they're just like going along at a quick clip. Um, you know, you just kind of like, all right, evidently, moving on, yeah. But what you want to do is, even if it's just for a second, have the mind that lays bare, the mind that exposes, the mind that is honest and open towards the enlightened mind, right? The non-deceptive mind that is ready to kind of just be very open about all of your faults. So you don't have to be thinking specifically like, that time I stole candy when I was five years old from the supermarket. You don't have to think like specific negativities. You just think the mind that completely lays bare. And we have to remember that who we're laying bare to or who we're being honest with is the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas who's in the form of this particular Buddha that we're practicing. And this is a perfectly compassionate being. Right? None of the judgment is going to be harsh. 
they're going to be far less harsh about our mistakes than we are with ourselves. They know the whole spectrum and reasons why we do everything far better than we know. They know our whole history of past lives that informed the behaviors that led up to the mistake. So you're not being judged, you're not being punished, you're not being scolded. You're being held in loving compassion that is together with perfect wisdom. And so this confession line in a way should feel like you dropping your guard, you letting your hair down, you sort of like metaphorically letting your gut out, right? It should be a relief. It should be a grand relaxation of, I don't have to tightly hold all my mistakes. I don't have to protect myself. I don't have to be defensive. Actually, here it is, warts and all, Buddhas. And the Buddhas are like, we already knew, <laughs> pat, pat, <laughs> right? We already knew, but you having laid it bare, now we have something to work with. Now we have ways to purify. Before you owned up to it, there was really not much we could do about it. We still loved you, but now there's some workability. So, you know, I often feel like it's, it's like a wound, our mistakes. They're like wounds that we keep protecting and we're like ashamed of because they're so gross and pussy and whatever. And we're just like, don't look, don't look. But as soon as you take your hand away, it gets some air in there and it can actually start to heal. Yeah, so this line of confession, you know, sometimes you'll do it in, a, you know, a 30 second, five minute, you know, sort of 20 minute way. Sometimes you'll just do it in a second, but just take a moment and think, I lay bare all my mistakes. Yeah, really fearlessly because you're being held with such compassion in doing so. And then the very next step is rejoicing, which is the, the other end. So I rejoice in the merit of all ordinary and holy beings. The first ordinary being is you. So you think also I lay bare all of my positivity, not just all my negativity. Yeah, let's take a moment and say, yep, I am not too bad, <laughs> right? Or like, there have been moments, there have been some good moments where I felt the sentient beings, you know, imperfectly, inconsistently, but did my best for sentient beings, right? And, and you take a moment and really celebrate the fact that any virtue ever happens. Because given our innate ignorance, given our self-cherishing, it's like a miracle anytime we think of others. Really, like it's amazing that our Buddha nature somehow bursts through, <laughs> right? And that we start to work on it and develop it into any sort of practice is really amazing. So you rejoice and you think how wonderful it is I'm doing this practice, for example. Yeah, this one right here, what I'm talking about in this moment, how wonderful it is I sat down and decided to practice today. That I was nice to my family, that I was good to my neighbors, that I, whatever. But then you do this radiating out of also rejoicing in good that is done. So this, this particular practice, Lama Zopa Rinpoche emphasizes a lot in terms of one of the quickest ways to accumulate positive karma or to accumulate merit. Because anytime you rejoice in the positive actions of yourself and others, you amplify the merit that was already created. So it's kind of like an amazing way of um, doubling and tripling and quadrupling the merit that's already there. So if someone else is doing an amazing thing and you think, how great, you also get a huge amount of merit, right? It's very efficient. Um, but the side benefit is that rejoicing cuts the potential for jealousy. It's a direct antidote to jealousy. And jealousy is one of the hardest things to address on the spiritual path because it's so embarrassing and so insidious. Like we know our anger, we know our attachment, they are our old companions, they are very obvious, but pride and jealousy are sneaky and they're very much societally reinforced. Um, and a lot of the things that we read in our culture or a lot of the advertisement in our culture is saying, be competitive, be ambitious, be the best, all of that kind of like pushing energy that can then make us really comparative 
and looking at ourselves in comparison to others so often, which feeds our discontent and feeds our alienation. So rejoicing practice cuts jealousy and it maximizes merit. So when we're doing it in this prayer form so quickly, you can just think how wonderful it is good is done by ordinary beings, by holy beings, just genuinely how wonderful it is. And moving on. If you're doing it in a long meditation form, you do the gradual kind of concentric circles outward. So you rejoice in your own positive actions, those of the people in your life, those of other ordinary beings like charitable workers, you know, people that are in professions that are ethical, that kind of thing. And then the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the Gurus. So you just kind of gradually work your way out with rejoicing practice if you're going to spend some more time with it. Does that make sense, those two, the, the um, confession and the rejoicing? Okay, so I'll drill down now into each one of them one by one, but I wanted to make sure to highlight those two in the prayer because those are kind of our first stuck spots where you think, goodness, that's quick for such deep ideas. So then here where it says, as our guide, I request you, O Buddhas, please abide well and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Those are two limbs, the request to stay and the request to teach. And those basically just create the cause to keep meeting the Buddhas in the form of the gurus, or at least teachings, and it helps us um, kind of create the cause for the long life of our teachers as well. So the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are not going to teach unless they're requested. So we're requesting and requesting and requesting. And then we dedicate. Okay, so number one prostration. So the first of the seven limbs is prostration, and prostrations are the specific antidote to pride, but they also purify all the negative karma accumulated with the body, speech, and mind. They are the cause to achieve a Buddha's Vajra body, Vajra speech, and Vajra mind. So prostration is something that can trigger all sorts of stuff for us, um, but I think that Look at it this way, you become receptive to what you respect. You become open to what you value. And so doing a behavior like two palms together in prostration while mentally thinking, I prostrate, yeah, it actually has a very powerful effect in your mind of like the deepest listening because you've given this being, this practice, this path, importance and significance in your mind. You've elevated it. So now it's sacred. Now it's special, which means that you're valuing it more and you're gonna be more open to it. So remember that prostrations like offerings are not for the Buddhas. They're not for the gurus. They're for our mind. The Buddhas will love us forever, whether we prostrate or not, right? The, the Buddhas will be of benefit to us, whether we make offerings to them or not. They don't care, right? They love us unconditionally. That's their job, okay? From our side, we need to create the causes to be open to the help and support that's constantly flooding us, right? The Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas wants nothing but our happiness and our awakening. But we sometimes feel so alone and we feel so disconnected from our refuge and so far away from our gurus. And we really feel like we're just trudging along on our path with no support. And ways to feel the support that's already there is to start connecting in these kind of ways with the seven limbs. So the prostration is to think Buddhahood exists. People have become enlightened. I have Buddha nature, I will become enlightened. I respect those who have already done this path. I also respect my own potential to do the same. So it's not like I'm bad and they're good, or I'm imperfect and they're perfect. It's that enlightenment is amazing and it's the potential of all of our minds. Let's take a moment and connect with the fact that there are beings who have become enlightened. 
yeah, and really respect the fact that that process happened for them. It also inspires us that we can do the same. So you should never feel lowly with prostration. It's more to subjugate your pride. And your pride is the thing that makes you feel isolated and alone. Yeah, and when we say pride in Buddhism, we're not talking about dignity. Keep your dignity, right? Keep your self-respect. But pride, pride is one of the worst things because you have no ears to listen anymore. If you already know everything, you can't ever get any better. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're in that pride headspace of I'm an expert, I already know. No one can tell you anything. You could have the Buddha in front of you giving you perfect instructions and it would just go over you, you know? So you're getting into this receptive headspace with prostration and that becomes so powerful for the rest of the practice because you're open. Do you have any, any triggers or questions about prostration or things that you've wondered about? Yeah, Lorna, go ahead. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. I'm finding this really helpful because I didn't know any of this stuff before and I've been practicing so, and I've often wondered about the, you know, what you start with and sort of the process of what you start with and what you end with and does it matter or, or should it be, you know, one after the another, the way it's laid out kind of thing. And the other question I have is, what I try to do around my jealousy is I live on the border of a beautiful neighborhood with big, beautiful houses. And sometimes I find myself going, oh, I wish I had a house like this and stuff. And then I immediately flip into, oh, I rejoice that all these people who have beautiful houses, you know, must have worked so hard in their past lives to have such good fortune in this life. Is that yeah, practical or make yeah. sense? Yep. Yep. Snuff that resentment. Snuff it right out. Yep. <laughs> yep. Can happen to us all. And, you know, your first question, yes, there is an order. If you're doing a practice manual, just do it as it written, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. If you're doing your own meditation practice, that's something simpler, that's not tantric. If you're doing like, for example, single pointed meditation on the breath, for example, you still want to prepare a conducive outer space and a conducive inner space. So you still want your room to feel fresh and clean. It doesn't have to be, you know, pedantic. It doesn't have to be persnickety, you know, but it just a bit tidyish than it was before. Some sort of representations of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas doesn't have to be fancy. And just sit and set your motivation. Refuge in Bodhicitta, four immeasurable thoughts, seven limb prayer at least refuge in bodhicitta. Yeah. So I should start off with the, with the prostration, so. Well, the thing is, is that before you sit down, usually we do three prostrations physically, but when you're doing the seven limb prayer, prostrations come first, it helps. Yeah, don't overthink it, just do the seven limbs as written one by one. But prior to the seven limbs, you do refuge in bodhicitta and the four immeasurable thoughts. Great, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, and you know, at whatever speed feels comfortable to you. Yes, uh, good morning. Good morning. I, have a question, I have a question about the pride. I understand how pride could be a hurtful and uh, egotistic. However, sometimes I don't think of pride as a, like something that I wanna hurt people with. It's more of a kind of self-confidence. I give myself self-confidence to give myself motivation. Is there like a distinct difference because, um, like somebody thinks I'm prideful, I just think it's a, a, a way to motivate, my, motivate myself because I'm aware that I lack in some areas because I want to get good at it, not because others want me to get good at it. Yeah, remember that in Buddhism, sometimes words that we use in English have a slightly different meaning. So in Buddhism, pride means looking down on others, right? So it's like a puffed up attitude. Maybe in English, we would normally call it arrogance. So when you hear pride discussed in Buddhism, we're talking about looking down and thinking that you're superior. And that is negative and that is untrue. Confidence is fantastic. We definitely want confidence. We definitely want dignity. Those are excellent qualities. And the distinction is something that you just have to sit with your own self and ask yourself, 
what is it like for me when I am in pride? What is it like for me when I'm in confidence? They're two distinct things, but it could be that what I look like and what I sound like is very similar on the outside, right? A confident person and a proud person might sound the same when they're doing public speaking or they're with their friends or they're whatever in a professional setting, but the motivation is the thing that you wanna look at. And if you're wanting to be better than others, that is just a recipe for going down the wrong road. If you wanna be better than who you were yesterday, that's fine. And the better than working towards enlightenment, oh, that's wonderful, right? And the confidence that you can, wonderful. But just kind of like sit with, for you as an individual, what is the difference between pride and confidence experientially? Knowing that in this context, pride is looking down and that that is very negative. Thank you very much. Hi, yes, I'm glad you're speaking to pride a bit because I have two things that kind of come up with prostration. And one is definitely arrogance, I'll admit it. Um, you know, but I think it's also linked in some ways for me, a fear of kind of snake oil, like, can I trust this teacher? Because um, I do think it leads to a very vulnerable state for myself. Um, and certainly that is part of what I have to do is to find good teachers, do the readings, but that is, I have to acknowledge my initial response oftentimes until I'm familiar with a teacher. And then I kind of, you know, then it's not a problem. So I wonder, I guess, two questions then, which is, is there kind of a mental kind of, I don't know, am I calling it an antidote? But when I have that feeling of arrogance arise, what I can do, um, but also maybe, I guess, you know, that I question my own faith sometimes, like, should I, am I, is this like a, mm, I need to develop my faith more, the fact that I'm suspicious. Well, certainly never get rid of your suspicion at the cost of common sense. There are snake oil salesmen out there. There are charlatans and people that are called lamas or called gurus, even have the tag Rinpoche that are just dodgy people that have bad motivations, but they might be charismatic and well-educated. You know, that exists, right? Human nature. So like part of your suspicion, I think, is healthy. And I'm guessing part of it is not. And you probably already know when it's healthy and when it's not, I'm guessing, if you were to just sit with it a little bit. But when you're doing prostration, think, I'm prostrating to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are beings who have perfected or are on the way to perfecting their minds to achieve a state that I aspire to. So I'm prostrating to them because I'm receptive to the path that they went through because I want to learn from their example, not because they're like better than me in and of themselves or something. It's that they're doing something I want to do and they've finished it. So I really wanna get into their slipstream and progress in that way. When it comes to like individual human beings and prostrations, that's a different case, right? Then don't force it, right? If the whole room is prostrating, you don't have to prostrate right? We don't have to be lemmings. Don't force it, you know? But it could be that you are feeling the peer pressure and the awkwardness of if I don't prostrate and everyone around me is going to think I'm an arrogant, you know, weirdo, you can just prostrate to the altar, which represents the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In your mind, you don't have to be prostrating to the person. Does that make sense? So if it's one of those cases where it just feels really weird and awkward and there's like a new teacher and you don't know them and sounds like they're great, but this is your first time, why should you just prostrate because everyone else does? One option, don't force it, just stand respectfully. Like it was a professor at a university coming into the room, you standing respectfully, that's polite. Um, or you can prostrate with everyone else, but just direct your mind to the altar and the holy objects. Does that help or, or were you getting snagged on something else? No, that's good. That kind of helps see steer my mind yeah. in a different direction because being sitting there being suspicious wasn't helping my practice. Right, <laughs> right, right. You know, so it's like be skeptical, but not cynical. I, uh, I, I need a bit of help maybe naming what's going on. So for whatever reason, at, at this point in my practice, I'm seeing deeper into pride and jealousy. So no accident I'm in this class <laughs> and I'm sort of overwhelmed by um, looking at well sort of really the tragedies that have been you know in my life because of that and realizing them thinking that they were great things 
<laughs> so it, and I, I feel really terrible. And I know that that's egoic or that's, that's considered, um, what, where do they, anyway, how to deal with these feelings, which I, I know were self-centered, but I can't get quite, I'm having trouble getting beyond them. Of, of having finally caught yourself in the habits you've been doing your whole life and now you're sort of embarrassed in front of yourself, that feeling? Well, yeah, and sort of overwhelmed with the grief because I see that, you know, the, the pride and the jealousy are so ridiculous. Not only was, you know, it's like celebrating our own uh, bad karma. You know, not only did I do it, I thought it was great. <laughs> and I thought yeah. I was great. And now I'm like, oh my God, not only was it not good, but I heard other people like, this is like the worst ever, you know, and I feel overwhelmed. I don't know why I'm seeing all this now, but what a blessing, but the overwhelming yeah. of, you know, like, so what is, what is that called when that overwhelm I know is, what is that called? Well, I mean, it could be any number of things, but it sounds like you've gone down the guilt road instead of the regret road. You know, oh, okay. and, right? Just good old yeah. fashioned guilt, which um, is not what we're about, um, but is right. so habituated and indoctrinated into us. Almost like if you see a fault and then you feel bad about it, right. the feeling bad about it somehow makes you less bad. That's guilt, right? It's like somehow that's your payment for having been bad is to feel bad. And that somehow makes up for having been bad. And it's nonsense, but it's how we were brought up. Regret okay. just goes, oh, that was a mistake. Glad I caught that. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, and actually regret can be almost, almost joyful or humorous because you thought, I think, oh, thank goodness I caught that. What a relief. That means I can start working on it. You know, I, I really think about catching negativities like how you would catch skin cancer, right? If you like are looking at your arm and you see a weird freckle, and you think, do you know what? That looks like skin cancer. Do you know what? I think it is. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I caught it while it was small. Burn it off, burn it off. You know, you're not thinking, oh, my sweet little skin cancer. Let's keep it forever. It's a part of me. No, <laughs> like get it off, <laughs> right? You're also not thinking, oh, I'm so bad for having spent so much time in the sun in my youth. Oh, curse my Irish ancestors. You just think, I'm glad I caught it. Get it off. And you're like happy to have caught it, right? right? So we want to think of our negativities like that. Like it came from a malfunction, right? Of cells or a malfunction coming from our innate ignorance. However, you want to frame it. Thank goodness you spotted it because now you can work on it. Not now that I've spotted it, I have more ways to punish myself. Oh, bingo. Thank right? you. Yes, just what I needed. I knew you had it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, regret, not guilt, not guilt. I needed the words. You right. know, the words are so powerful. I needed the words. I didn't have the words. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, you know, the thing that strikes me in the prostration that maybe hasn't been mentioned is whenever you see a great teacher, they come in and they prostrate to the altar, to the teachings first. So when I always feel like I'm, just being polite to let them get seated before I do the same thing and prostrate to the teachings, not, not to them in particular. It's like we're all doing the same thing together, not one person to another. Yeah, and that, that is a good way to think in the beginning, for sure. Once someone actually is your teacher, it becomes a different case and you are prostrating to them, but they're like the representative of the three jewels or the embodiment of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And so mm -hmm. prostrating to the guru as the guru has huge benefit and power. But in the beginning, thinking we're all in it together, you're prostrating to the teachings just as the teacher is prostrating to the teachings. That's mm -hmm. a perfect attitude, absolutely. Okay. Or with teachers that you haven't like taken on as gurus yet. That's right. a fine way to think for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And look, the whole guru business, it is hard to kind of get your head around. And there's so many potential pitfalls. And, you know, we've seen all sorts of religious organizations, educational institutions, financial institutions, any group of humans where there is power, we have seen people abuse power. 
haven't we, right? So you just like look at any history book, you look at any newspaper. Where there is power, there will be people that abuse power. And that is more devastating in a religious context. And we have hesitancy and fear and anxiety around kind of putting all our eggs in one basket with a person who might turn out not to be trustworthy. And that is common sense to keep. But we don't want to keep it at the expense of never connecting with the kind of power that comes with a spiritual mentor. So it's a delicate dance and it's a very personal inner conversation that you should never feel forced or rushed to have. But just because there are so many people who abuse power shouldn't put you off from looking for a pure teacher because they do exist. You know, so it's like, don't be naive and rush in, but also don't get cynical and jaded and avoid the benefit because the power of that spiritual mentorship is beyond words. Yeah, so it's just a delicate inner dance. And in this prostration stage, just keep it Buddhism Bodhisattvas for now. And when you have a guru, you include them in that. But basically the essence is I become receptive to what I respect. So I'm showing respect, I'm thinking respect, I'm making my whole being, body, speech, and mind connected with respect, not because they need respect, but because my respect makes me receptive. Yeah, and whatever I can do to get out of my own way, to clear my own pride, is going to help my progress. And so then similar thoughts with the offering verse where the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the gurus, they do not need your offerings. The offerings are for your sake. So the offerings are the particular antidote to attachment and miserliness and the cause of wealth and success. And as a result of making offerings to the merit field and practicing charity to sentient beings, your own wishes will succeed and you will have wealth and resources, not only in this life, but from life to life up to enlightenment. And when you achieve enlightenment, you will receive infinite offerings and experience the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and emptiness. So that's, you know, all very Lama Zopa, beautiful poetry and, you know, lots and lots of layers to unpack there. But really, if you're looking at offerings, just, just think about the way in which investing thing in something makes you pay more attention to it. So, you know, like, I don't know, if your kids are at a specific school and the school is having a fundraiser and you put money into that school, isn't it true that your level of investment in the outcome of that school is more than just about your own child and their education? There's some sort of like deep conviction of, I hope this school really does well over time, not just when my kids go through, but for all kids, your investment in the whole process is more because you've given money to it there's kind of like an, in, there's a connection there. So there's all sorts of psychological things related to making offerings that are not about the substances of the offering. It helps you invest in the practice. It helps set the scene. And it also really helps cut greed and miserliness and attachment to beautiful things and objects by offering it to representations of what you respect representations of what you aspire to. Then the side effect is it creates the causes for resources in the future. So you wind up benefiting down the track anyway. But you know things like offerings, the immediate benefit too is that it makes your mind happy to see beautiful things laid out in front of the representations of your own path. So there's layers and layers and layers, but the point of in the seven limbs is make sure that whatever you literally have on the altar has been ethically acquired. You know, like don't steal your neighbor's flowers, right? But, um, you know, I've seen it happen, <laughs> right? Don't steal your neighbor's flowers. And, you know, don't think it has to be a whole elaborate song and dance. Part of the power is the repetition. So if you offer just one little bowl of pure clean water, but you do it every single day, it creates a habit of generosity. And then in your daily life, it's much easier to be spontaneously generous because you're creating that pattern in your mind. Does it make sense? 
So there's layers and layers and layers. So confession we talked about, um, the third limb is the confession of non-virtue. So confession is the antidote to the three poisonous minds of ignorance, anger, and attachment, and to all negative karma. It is the cause to achieve the result of Dharmakaya, the mind of all the Buddhas. So it's laying bare and it's honesty and transparency before the eyes of the compassionate Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Then you get rejoicing. And rejoicing is the particular remedy to the delusion of jealousy, like we talked about, and it creates the cause for success. As a result of rejoicing, you will achieve the holy body of a Buddha, which is so incredibly beautiful that no matter how many times one looks at it, the mind is never satiated. So rejoicing has many uh, miscellaneous benefits. Then request to teach. This is the particular antidote to the very heavy negative karma of abandoning the holy dharma. It's the cause to achieve the holy speech of a Buddha and to be able to give teachings to many sentient beings in the future. Giving up any teaching taught by the Buddha because you don't understand it is avoiding the holy dharma. So this is a little bit of a tricky concept and this is a very um, popular teaching topic for Lama Zopa Rinpoche about how heavy it is to abandon the dharma. And this isn't about if you get distracted or if you forget, it's about saying, here's something that I'm not going to do. And you do it with like an afflicted mind. You put it aside with an afflicted of mind. Like it's too hard. I don't like it. Push it away. Or it's, you know, you're having some sort of um, agitation, aggression, um, disrespect for a precious thing that you've connected with. So it's like the Dharma is like this beautiful gift that we've been given. And you look at the gift and you say, Bleh, and you throw it out the window. Abandoning the Dharma isn't something that you can do accidentally. It's something that is going to have a lot of intention to it. So when you see how very heavy, heavy, heavy it is, don't freak out. If you just forgot about something or you said, do you know what? That topic is not resonating for me yet. I'm going to put it to one side. I'll come back to it when it makes sense to come back to it. That's fine, right? Or that's a little bit too much hair splitting, nuance, philosophical points for where my head is at right now, but I'm sure it's important and precious and works in a certain context. Greatest respect, I'm putting it to one side for now. That's okay. Yeah, don't worry about that. It's about that kind of like aggressive, like this is stupid, right? <laughs> Never mind this, you know tossing it aside, disrespect. Um, there's some commentaries that say that abandoning the Dharma can also have kind of a adjacent factor of disrespecting other religions. So it's something that we want to be careful of if we're seeing people who are badly behaved, who say that they represent a certain religion and we're talking with our friends about politics and whatever, and we say those damn blah, blah, blahs, that's hugely heavy negative karma. We don't wanna ever disrespect other religions. We can totally debate with them about philosophical points. We can talk about the bad behavior of specific practitioners, but that's a whole different thing than saying this religion is bad or you know something like that because religions, that move sentient beings towards more love and compassion and ethics are good. It's none of our business, kind of what people believe as long as it's not hurting anyone, right? So, um, you know, and who's to say that these other religions aren't also created or revealed by enlightened beings to suit the needs of those specific beings who want to be taught in that way? Who's to say? So, um, you know, if there's a terrorist attack, talk about the faults of terrorism, not the religion they pretend to ascribe to. Fundamentalism can creep into any religion, Buddhism included. Fundamentalism is a problem. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just kind of like keeping that respectful attitude that there are countless tools to assist the project of awakening. If some of those tools aren't of interest to me right now or aren't of use to me right now, then we very respectfully have distance from them, rather than with an aggressive mind that says they're bad. 
Does that make sense? So this requesting for the guru to teach helps purify having done that in the past. So that's an amazing reason to do this limb, but it also creates the cause to meet ethical teachings again and again in the future and to be able to give them ourselves. So a request to teach is a really powerful limb. And then we have request to stay and request to stay and request to teach are sometimes swapped the order. The rest of them, they go in the same order every time, but these two sometimes are swapped around just fun fact. Um, so the sixth limb is requesting the gurus to remain for a long time in Nirmanakaya aspect, meaning an aspect that we can relate to and talk to and see. So this is the particular antidote to the heaviest negative karma of disturbing the guru's holy mind, belittling and giving up the guru and so on. It's the cause for your own long life and to achieve the immortal holy Vajra body. So that's a lot, right? Um, first, the whole premise of disturbing the guru's mind is a weird premise, right? How can you disturb the mind of someone who's supposedly enlightened? That is a good debatable point. Please do debate with teachers when they bring it up. But what we're talking about is going against advice, which means what? You've asked for advice. Right? So what you want to think about is if you're actually developing a relationship with a teacher and you say, my practice is this, this, and this, should I do this or this? And the teacher says, do this, and you do the opposite. What was the point of asking their advice? Yeah, if you weren't going to take it on board, why ask? If you already know what you're going to do, then you don't need to ask, do you? Right? So if you're going to ask the guru's advice, you have to be ready to do what they say. It's not about, um, I guess, putting yourself down or disrespecting yourself or doing the things that seem bad or something. If the guru gives you bad advice, meaning unethical, you politely say that it goes against the very teachings that you taught me. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Was it a trick? <laughs> So, you know, never feel like you have to do something that goes against ethics. You should never do something that goes against ethics, even if the guru tells you to. Okay, that goes without saying. But this whole concept of disturbing the guru's mind, we're really talking about going against good advice that you've asked for. Does that make sense? So if you're not in a place to take advice, don't ask for it. Yeah. And also what winds up happening is that you get to a certain level with your teacher where you feel like you can ask questions and advice. And then you get to another step with your teacher where they say, trust yourself. Yeah, you sort of integrated and embodied and sort of merged with the guru-ness and you can answer your own questions. So um, there's a lot of mistakes that can happen with the guru-disciple relationship, but they're not your father, they're not your husband, they're not your best friend, they're not your therapist, they're your guru, and that's a very different relationship than we've ever had in samsara. And what you're looking for is something that speaks to your own wisdom. The guru speaks to your own wisdom and wakes it up. And how do you know a guru is right for you? there's resonance. So there's plenty of good gurus that might not be right for you. Doesn't mean they're not good, they're just not right for you. You're looking for someone who, in a way, it's like they're similar to you in some way, just a few more steps along the path or dramatically more steps along the path. And when they speak, there's something in you that almost already knew what they meant. It's like they're reminding you of something that you forgot, or they're elevating something that you were already moving that direction with. So if you've made that sort of relationship with someone, it's a very deep thing to go against their advice because it's almost like you're going against your own heart. Does that make sense? So the request to stay in the seven limbs, it can be just a brief moment please stay, show the aspect of long life. May I keep meeting teachers? Part of this is also recognizing how much quicker your progress is when you have an actual human teacher, as opposed to just reading from books or having peer led groups. It's like light speed 
when you finally meet your teacher. So the benefit is huge. Um, so you wanna keep creating the cause to meet teachers in this Nirmanakaya aspect or this accessible aspect. And then the last one is dedication and you're dedicating the merit. And this is the particular antidote to heresy and anger, which destroy merit and the cause to achieve the two Buddha bodies, the Dharmakaya and the Rupakaya. So when you dedicate the merit, you're basically saying all of this effort I just made, may it go towards enlightenment. May it not be lost. May the momentum not be lost. May the energy not be lost. May all of this energy go towards this final goal of my enlightenment so I can benefit sentient beings. And dedicating is just, a, it can just be a second, you know? Like for example, if you have pets, you can think, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings? And in the, in the vein of doing that, I will now feed my cat this act of generosity, you pour the, the little pebbles in the dish, fill up their water, and then dedicate. May the merit of this generosity to this animal lead to my complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Right? And now you've just created another seed for enlightenment, just feeding the pets, you know? It's just a thought, right? Dedications and motivations, these are just thoughts in your head that have power. So don't get trapped in the prayer. The prayer is to make you have a thought, and that's the thing that creates the momentum. Okay, so we'll have um, a 10 minute break and then we'll go ahead and do Medicine Buddha Puja, but we'll keep talking about these things tomorrow as well. So have a little stretch and I'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> 